questions before in the first session, but not from everyone. So remember what Lisa said, right? Two hands, you only need one, just raise it if you have a question. Okay, very good. Now, displacement analysis. Um, compare the value of different pieces of business to identify the one that brings the most value to the hotel. If you are in a fortunate situation that there is displacement possibilities, that's good, right? No displacement options means your demand is rather low and you take whatever business there is. But if you have competing businesses um, where one is more valuable than the other, then you have to make the right choice to take that business which optimizes your revenue and your profitability. So when we talk about group business, um, you can displace also one other segment, so you can displace uh, for example, uh, bar business with uh, contracted business or bar business with uh, OTA business. But for this afternoon, we are talking specifically about group displacement analysis. So the total value of the business and uh, compare it with the total value of other businesses, trends into other groups that would be displaced if the group business was accepted. So group displacement, groups can be from any kind of sizes depending on your hotel. Uh, groups can start. When does groups start? Normally as per international market segmentation, when, with how many rooms? How many rooms we call it a group? More than, yes, 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 that's right, 10. It's 10 groups um, or for wholesale, there's still um, some Companies define uh, groups from seven because 15 paying guests. That's very old traditional pricing. They still have some wholesale contracts which define groups as 15 paying guests or seven rooms. But mostly we are saying 10 rooms or more. Okay. So if you, would you take this business? Um, if we having these two parts, a potential group business to the trends in displacement. And that would occur. So we have trend in rooms of 40 at a uh, dollar value of 200, which brings an $8,000 total revenue. And we have a group business also 40, um, which would take the business only to us if um, we offer them 160, $6,400. Very straightforward question. Would you take this group, yes or no? no. Anyone, yes? Oh, that's good. Okay, so all no. Based on the information you have provided, we have provided here, there is really very, very easy because you're comparing revenue to revenue and with no other information, $8,000 is more than 6400 Now, um, we are handing out some um, uh, exercise now, um, as I said, right? So please get your calculator ready um, and your pens. There has to be, and please only look at the first page. Do not turn the page. I know it's tempting, um, but please do not turn the page. Just look at the first page, okay? First page only. We will watch you, okay? So please do not turn the page. All right, now on this first page, um, you have the exercise to actually decide if you want to take this group or not. So off you go. Um, you are allowed to use calculator to make a decision if you want to take this group or not. Okay, now who would like to share the answer? Are we taking this piece of business or not? Anyone saying yes? You say yes. You say oh we have some yes and we have some no. Very good. Okay. Um, so you take that piece of business, why? Uh, because for, for the time CN they have cancelled or no show and for May have cancelled and no show. Is there anything in the instruction saying cancel or no show? I know, so you just made that up. So you think it might happen, okay? Well, no, we don't know about that. Um, so if we say there's no cancel and no show, would you then take the group? Why would you not take the group? Okay. <laughs> okay. So how do we determine to take the group or not in this example? 
Calculate the revenue. So what is the revenue um, for the first part when we take the transient? Hmm? Okay, and for the group business? Okay. Do we actually need to calculate the revenue? It's the same number of rooms, but what is different? That's right. So actually, I gave you some time to do this, but it should not take more than one second <laughs> to decide. Okay? So please don't overcomplicate. Page one is a very simple exercise. It's just comparing, as we see on the screen, right, in the screen example, it's comparing the same number of rooms with one price for group when one price for transient, if the transient price is higher, okay, of course, we do not take the group. All right, very good. Now, but it is, as you already figured out, it's not as easy as that. There are more factors to consider. Now, look, let's look at this one. So we still have the same number of rooms for transient and group. So we have the same rate uh, difference for ADR 200 and 160. So until here, still revenue. Now, we talk about ancillary revenues. What could be ancillary revenues? Give me an example. F and B, yes. Yes, functions, spa, yes. Anything else which there might be. Why are there both for group and for transient? Why are we having ancillary revenues for both segments? right because also the transient guest might spend some other revenue depending on the transient segment right so we have wholesale segment which potentially spend maybe less in salary then we have OTA segment which might go to F and D and spa and more but mostly also F transient segment they have some ancillary revenues but in this case the group is small we assume because they have a function right and that's more F and B meeting rooms and things like that so one to worth is 5,000. The room cleaning cost of $600 in this case is the same. Well, because it's the same, right? I mean, why it would, doesn't cost more uh, to clean a room for a group guest than it does for an FIT. Um, so there we have 600 really dark. Then we have catering cost in this case, so they do have a function, but uh, if they do have a function, there's some cost associated with it. Could be food and beverage cost, could be AV equipment cost, we don't know, but we just deduct that here. Now, then we are combining the total, everything again, so we have now 8.6 versus 9.8. What is your verdict? Do we take the group or not? Yes. How, why do we take the group? Because it's more revenue. Very straightforward. So we just added a bit more component here, right? but by adding these more components, we changed our decision from not taking the group 8,000 versus 64 to taking the group 8,600 versus 9,800. All right, which brings us to part two of the exercise. Now you can turn. Okay, <laughs> yes. Okay, who would like to share the answer? Are we taking the group or are we not taking the group? Yes, I see some nodding, we're taking the group, right? So what's the result for this example? Um, now, why we are taking the group? How much revenue do we make for transient? Mm -hmm, okay, um, why don't you share with the group, everyone? How much we're making? 46, and for transient? 304, okay, everybody agrees? Very good, okay. So, I following the same example, um, we're basically adding the ancillary revenues and you can see um, without much um, calculation that the ancillary revenues is way exceeding what we can make with transient, with 176,000. So, even if you don't calculate, Again, maybe this time two seconds, and then you should make a decision if you can take it or not based on these numbers. It's very simple, right? Um, but it is obviously we have to get these numbers, making sure um, that they are right, so then we can make the right decision. 
Now, we have, uh, we're making it slightly more complex and now we're adding the walk cost, okay? So what happens if we have to walk guests? Right, sometimes by taking the group, um, we would not only displace trend in business, but we potentially also then uh, are so sold out that we have to walk some guests. Now, in this case, if we include the walk cost into this uh, group um, total calculation, then we are moving from 8,600 for transient compared to 6,750 for the group. Hence, we would not take the group, right? So the complexer we go. Now, this is very quick. On your spreadsheet, page number three, we have done the same thing. Um, so is if you take walk rooms, and you have to pay 10,785 per room, would you then take the group business? Yes or no? By walking 10 trends in business. So we're adding the negative cost onto the group. Would we still take the group? Before you said we take the group, are we now taking the group or are we not taking the group? Whoever has the answer, just shut, oh, you have the answer ready. And how come you're so fast? The previous one, your profit over transient would be about 40,000. You're now spending 107 on walking people, so 40 minus 107. Don't need a calculator for that, right? Very good, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so obviously the walk cost depends on each of your properties, right? I mean, walk cost can change by season, right? It can obviously is changes by location, by hotel property type. Um, do you have all the uh, dynamic walk cost or you have one flat walk cost or you never walk? That's the word. If you never walk, if something is wrong um, because that means you never overbook. But never overbooking is not correct. So you should walk from time to time because by walking, um, you actually make more money overall because the probability of selling out increases. If you never overbook, you will very rarely sell out. Okay. Now, booking method. Okay, I think that's the last step in this. Uh, if we add the booking method, obviously different booking methods have different costs to it um, on there. So for here, we just added the combination of um, uh, booking via OTAs, which has a commission, booking via GDS, which has a booking cost, um, booking uh, from the uh, web direct channel, uh, versus here, the combination of um, calling the hotel and then um, booking via web direct with a call in. So if you add these two together, would we change our mind and then now take the group or would we not take the group? No, we would not take the group we st because still we're making more money with transient. Let's go to page four, everyone, and then just complete this exercise um, and then see what the final outcome is for our example. Would we or would we not take the group? Okay, are we taking the group? Yes or no? We're not taking group. Everybody in agreement or somebody would like to take the group? No, okay, so we're not taking the, why are we not taking the group? What's the final revenue? Two? Two, five, two, where is this? Right, Okay, two, five, two for a group, which is lower than the FIT. Yes. Okay, so we're all in agreement. All right, so finally now, um, we decided not to take the group. Uh, because we're including all the booking costs, walk costs um, overall, and the entire revenue, it, it's not worth it. We are displacing more um, than we're actually making with this group. Very good. Okay. Um, what else do you think was missing? So we have no transit length of stay, right? We assume the one nine length of stay with the displacement calculation. But obviously, not every booking is one night length of stay. So we could potentially displace two night, three night, five night, 40 nights uh, for all we know. Um, obviously, another one is impact of that group acceptance will have on demand for room nights before and after the group walk, right? So it will impact that. What are other considerations we have to uh, um, take into account? 
Now, the long-term potential that this group may bring to the hotel, um, will this piece of business bring additional group or transient opportunities? This is something when I was on property revenue manager with the sales team always told me. Yes, I know it's displacing, but there's so much potential. This group will potentially book five or ten more times. I, do you have a contract? No, but I'm sure it will come. Um, so I, that's something which we obviously need to consider, right? Because sometimes it's actually correct that uh, it's a piece of business which the calculation tells us is displacing trends in, but because of potential future business, maybe in low season, maybe regular business, we just accept that displacement, right? Sometimes it's not correct. So it's, you know, up to the revenue and sales team to come to an agreement on that. Um, is this a regular event that the hotel wishes to capture, right? It could be another element. Is there known history for this group? Um, known history is also very important for wash factor. If we take a group and uh, let's say we have a 200 room hotel, it's a 100 room block, so 50% of the inventory, but then at the end only 50 rooms show up, we have a problem. Okay, so depending on the attrition, the wash factor of the group, no show factor, if we know historically that how they behave, we can take this into consideration to make the right decision. Some companies, they pre-wash, right? They put only a part of that. Some companies don't. So it's really up to your decision of what kind of group business you take. Corporate behaves also different than leisure in terms of um, the wash factor. Um, are there other potential ancillary revenues that may be realized through this group, right? So that's the earning potential beyond the meeting space and the meeting itself. Some groups are open to, let's say, uh, if you have a spa um, and this group just is a corporate meeting business and you could offer the group organizer, your group members get 10% off or you know, 15 minute teaser treatment in the spa, you can drive incremental revenue into the spa, for example, right? Some other groups don't, so it really depends on the group itself if they are open to this kind of ancillary revenues, uh, so it needs to be analyzed, but something to be taken into consideration, what else can we take out of this group? Okay. Another element, does this piece of business bring any advantage to the hotel? Um, here you can see a significant customer. Is this group um, brought in by an influencer, a company which can bring other pieces of business? Again, something which the numbers not necessarily tell us the whole story, right? The numbers can really clearly tell us, okay, we displace business or we do not displace business, but the numbers not necessarily tell us if this, because of this piece of business, we get additional piece of business, not from the same group, but maybe other groups. Maybe this is an um, incentive group from a company which brings in other companies, right? And then these other companies are potential customers for you as well, who can have, can have a lead on effect. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things which you know you have to take in mind before you actually make the final decision to reject that group. Um, is the significant customer of the hotel company? Should customers overall value um, to the entire, consider, entire corporation to be considered? What does that mean? If you are part of a chain or a group, um, that means that even if you displace business, this particular company might, mean, might be a very important customer for the whole group, right? So let's say you have multiple hotels and multiple uh, destinations. This group has potential group business um, at different destinations, but your particular hotel, you are displacing revenue on this particular day. But if you don't take this business, then the whole business for the group might be potentially um, not happening and not being realized. So these are other factors to take into consideration. And sometimes we had to take one for the team. Right? When, when you talk about a bigger picture. Okay. Is there a way to recover expenses that you have if you're taking one for the team? Very good question. Um, I think that's something you should ask your corporate office. Um, it's uh, a... <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, no, I think for you as a hotel, right, I mean, sometimes this question comes very relevant when we talk about different ownerships, right? So you have managed hotels owned by different owners. And then you take one piece of business which displaces revenue, um, but then your owner says, okay, my GOP is impacting, but then you say, but, you know, for the group it's very good. The owner doesn't really care. Right? So that is something which is a bit difficult, right? which uh, you, know, you have to explain. Um, but then you always can say, well, but this same group might come back to us at another time, which then has a positive impact on the GOP. So try to make a positive spin on this. And it doesn't happen that often that you get these kind of businesses. Um, but uh, this not only applies for group, but also sometimes corporate business. That some hotels, they have to take a little bit lower rate mm -hmm. for another hotel, so you help each other um, on that if you are part of a bigger chain. Okay, anticipated revenue objectives. Okay, where are higher value rooms or function space opportunities uh, displaced? Function, and we're not talking about function space today, but this is another interesting part. Function space can be utilized by in house groups, including rooms, or only social meetings, right? Sometimes the social meetings bring you more money, we talk a wedding, than a group, okay? And so we have to take the whole picture into consideration. We also could displace some revenue for the events team by taking the group. Even though the profitability for rooms uh, might be higher if you take a group plus the meeting space, but the overall spend, uh, depending on the overall spend, could also be higher if you take only social. So there's a lot of, most factors need to be taken into consideration. This gets uh, much more complicated when we talk about different lead times. Lead times for wedding are way longer than, than it is for uh, groups with uh, meeting rooms. So you sometimes have to make a decision, do you really want to take that group business or for um, auspicious days, if you uh, look at the Chinese, uh, yellow, you all know about the yellow book, right? Chinese calendar, one of the special days is also used here in Thailand. Um, when you have very, very high um, demand for weddings, uh, long term in the future, and then you, on those days, you get a group request, better think twice. If you want to take the group blocking your ballroom, or if you want to wait for a wedding, uh, which might come even later than that for this particular piece of business. A lot of uh, money involved. Did the hotel turn away more valuable opportunities from other segments? Um, how did the hotel perform relative to its competitive set during the time period? That's the post-analysis, right? So after you've decided to either take the group or not take the group, if it is a significant piece of business, then you should do a post-event analysis and then see, okay, how have you performed versus your competition, right? We're looking at, we talked about STR data, Fabian talked about that before. Um, is your RGI going up or is your RGI going down because of that piece of business? Can you establish new thresholds for similar time periods to maximize future demand based on what was learned from the situation? Again, coming back to um, the question before, if it did have a positive impact, something you can repeat. If it did not have a positive impact, actually then you might reconsider the way how you evaluate the group the next time and saying, okay, maybe um, you have to ha give higher value to the displacement revenue, whatever the reason was why you decided not to take or to take the group. Um, what would you recommend now based on what was learned, right? So always trying to see this as a learning opportunity for future uh, businesses. Moving into, okay, let me ask you a question. Any questions on group and group displacement, group contracting? Before we move on. Yes? Is there a way to evaluate how much your, your displacement cost would be on reputational damage by walking people? Because you, the, the cost, I mean, the cost of booking a room at another hotel is fairly easy to measure, but is there a way to measure how pissed off guests will hurt your reputation by being walked? Well, um, unlikely the walk guests will use social media to complain. So that's a good thing. I mean, if they would use social media to say I was walked and was very unhappy about the problem, but statistics show they don't. If they have a problem then and they stay in the hotel, they complain about it, but not if they've been walked. So, but of course the individual guest might not come back. So you're talking about uh, potential impact customer lifetime value. So if that potential customer might have come back 25 times and now you lost them forever, we cannot. 
right? Unfortunately, our technology doesn't allow us yet to really measure individual customer lifetime value. Um, but on social media, I wouldn't be too much worried on that. So I think the risk of not walking for profitability is higher than to, as you said, piss off the guest. So I think um, if uh, I had this in the past, some of uh, I work mostly for corporate for corporate chains. Um, some general managers um, they can say, "Oh, we cannot walk. We cannot walk. You know, our reputation five star and impossible." It is not the right decision from a profit optimization perspective because it is very hard to sell out if you do not overbook. So my recommendation would always to overbook. Unless there's some cases, like you have uh, Formula One Singapore um, or Olympics or very, very high events, you better think twice because then there's nowhere to walk to, right? So that happened to me as well personally. Very, very long time ago, an event happened in the city I was in um, and uh, I had to walk gas. Actually, the front desk had to walk and this was 200 kilometers south of the city um, <laughs> because there was absolutely nothing. Um, around. Yes, I know. Yes, it wasn't a happy day. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, well, there's only two rooms. But we managed the transportation and everything like that. But it was nothing in that city. I mean, really, absolutely not a use hostel, nothing. Okay, now moving into contracting. Um, contract pricing, also known as negotiated pricing, um, established that through meetings and discussions between hoteliers and uh, travel company, com companies. Now, factors to consider for negotiating pricing structure. So obviously, these are the things which you do take into, or should take into consideration. Um, estimated volume is really everybody does that, right? So that's a long time ago, um, where you have a depth of sale chart, where you have, okay, it's a uh, 1,000 rooms per year, that's one price, 100 rooms, whatever your um, different um, criteria are. Um, then you have seasonal uses pattern of day and day of week. That is still something which not everybody does, but everybody should. Because, um, and we heard that from Fabian as well, if you have a corporate account who predominantly travels from Tuesday, let's say your, your business hotel travels Tuesday to Thursday, which are your peak days, if you're a city hotel, right? But then you are able to tell them, okay, by if you change your travel pattern to arrive either on Monday or arrive on Friday, I give you an X percent discount, there might be very well a win-win because you displace less business and both of you could be happy. Um, seasonal usage pattern is another one. Some accounts, they might only uh, use um, your property when you really don't need them because they come during the peak season. But when you actually do need them, let's say your summer season is low, then they also don't visit you. Um, so this is something which needs to be analyzed and be part of the negotiation. And salary revenues, so anything which is incremental spent, SPA and F&D, by those customers could also mean upsell, right? Some companies, the guests themselves, they are easy to be upsold. And when you look at the data, it shows you, okay, they have contracted the deluxe room, but 50% uh, of their travelers, they lose club deluxe or grand deluxe or whatever you have, which means, okay, that is something which you take into consideration. Their entry price might not be that high, but because of the upselling or their buying up opportunities, the total average rate is higher. That's another one which sometimes gets overlooked. Booking method, how do they book? Now, we obviously don't want to discriminate against any channel, but we also know that some channels are more expensive than others, okay? Which is the most expensive, just for, not commission, but just for uh, channel cost? Yes, correct, GDS, global distribution, is the most expensive channel uh, because you have all those pass-through fees. Um, some is by your CRS provider, then you have the GDS itself. Um, so there's a couple of uh, things on top. Commission, not a factor for corporate accounts because mostly they are not commissionable. Um, but then others, they book direct. Um, others, they might use Agencia um, or f some other OTA related. So different booking methods. We have to find out how much actually is the booking cost for those corporate accounts. What channel do they prefer? Do we take it into consideration for negotiation? Okay. Can you offer them a promo code to book you through your website? Very cost-effective channel, obviously, if they book direct through your website. 
fixed or dynamic pricing. Also, um, Fabian talked about that. And yes, he mentioned that. I almost wanted to stand up. He mentioned that when the procurement man said, well, I can't budget accordingly. I don't believe in that. I think that's just an excuse. Um, I think um, as a hotel, you should sit down with the procurement manager and actually do some calculation. If you tell the procurement manager, okay, you can't budget, but I guarantee you, you will spend less money if you go to dynamic pricing, they will listen. Because mostly um, dynamic pricing will save them money. Because if they have a fixed pricing, um, that's very easy to calculate, but then you have your special deals which then means, okay, the special deals you have to offer to them as well, right? So their fixed price is already out the window because otherwise they complain. But if they go dynamic, okay, if you have high demand, they're still getting an advantage because you get a discount off, but they still buy, so which means high ADR. And if you need the business and you have a special, yes, they're getting a lower price, but still you don't displace anything. So as much as you can, Hong Kong is a city where it's very easy to go dynamic pricing. I think more the counts and less accounts are already on dynamic pricing model. Um, here in Thailand, still very difficult, okay? Um, when you think from a global perspective, um, most of the procurement still prefer fixed pricing, but I personally believe this will change over time. Expectation of value as and inclusions, that means what other perks the company wants to have. Do they want a discount on laundry? Um, do they want to have a discount on other things? Um, whatever else, uh, transportation, what are some companies have said, okay, happy to give you a contract if you provide free transportation. Please make sure you calculate correctly, right? Um, that really depends, do you want to get a shuttle and then shuttle them back and forth? How much volume does this company need to produce that it makes sense for you to offer that kind of service? Okay. If the performance expectations are not realized, so they might have the legal right, and that depends on location. Each country is a bit different to change the rate and even potentially collect money to make up for the lost profit based on missed performance goals. Basically what this says, okay, if you have agreed with the company on a special price because of volume and they do not deliver the volume, well, who is drawing the short stick, right? It's you, unless, you go back to the company and telling them in the middle of the year, please <coughs> increase, we need to increase your price because you are definitely not going to make up um, the goal of the room nights you have promised you will deliver uh, by the beginning of the year. Uh, but it's, it's clearly stated in the contract that we, have, that we can revert back to the main contract pricing that supersedes the, the special pricing if they don't meet their, their target. But because it's not black and white, they will always say, yeah, but each of is this and impact there and that's why I can't, I can't meet my target. It is what it is unless there's a, a renegotiation plan like halfway through the contract period whereby you say, uh, is it is it the it's contract? Is it finish. still realistic, mm -hmm. or have has the has the death of the king impacted it, or has have other uh, situations beyond our control <coughs> impacted in such a way that it's no longer realistic to expect those those contract conditions? There are two parts now for global RFPs. It is more challenging to change the price from mid year for locally negotiated rates. You can do that. Have a negotiation at the beginning for the contracting and tell them it could be to both benefits. You could give them an incentive. If you produce more room nights than X, we will reduce your rate, right? Give them an incentive because they're not, you're not the only hotel they're using. They're using other hotels. The other hotel, your competitor, will not give them incentive. If you give them incentive, it might actually work in both favors. You can reduce their price mid-year, right, if they produce more than that. But if they don't produce at all or very low, well, then it would be an increase in price. As long as you negotiate in the beginning, have this conversation, you can do. But the problem is that 
most of the hotels don't have the conversation A and B later on if you don't have the conversation then mediate to go to the account saying will I need to increase your price very very difficult right and then most salespeople don't do that because then ah, I don't know and relationship and so on but it costs you money I mean literally it does cost you money if you have based your projections on X volume with Y price and they get the price but you don't get the volume well as I said, you're the short straw there. Yes? But then, what if they have a special deal with the hotel directly, but they're also contacted with GTA? If the hotel says, sir, you didn't make your target, I'm gonna increase your rate, they say, that's fine, then I'm just gonna book through GTA. Yes, um, and nowadays, since the corporate accounts, they're using all kinds of channels, and nothing you can do there, that's <coughs> correct, right. But not everybody goes to GTA. So this is if you have some accounts with using alternative channels uh, where they can find a better deal. Um, which I don't want to talk about rate parity. And now this would be an endless discussion. Um, okay. <laughs> Moving on. Um, review clause allows to tell a client to review. So that's what we mentioned, right? If you have a rev review clause in the contract, um, and it should also should state the frequency of the reviews, right? So it is really, if you do um, frequency uh, four times a year, I think that would be, it could be a shorter review a quarter and more longer review every six months. Uh, but I think then each of you could be on track of what you want to achieve. It's highly recommend every day implements tracking method ensures each account production can be easily reviewed, right? So there are either, I mean, we, uh, the good old PMS, obviously, um, maybe one option where you can ac do account production tracking, and then there's the Excel spreadsheet, and then there's a more sophisticated third-party vendors uh, who give you um, account production um, um, uh, review options where you can also easily look at this, their spend and their booking pattern and so on. So depending on how much your company is spending on the evaluation of accounts, there's different methods. But no matter what, each of you have a PMS, so at least there you can see how much has been produced and when. Last room availability, right? Um, estimated production, um, room types, and stay pattern. So these are the four elements um, that should be discussed and included in the guideline when you talk about corporate negotiation, right? So don't throw in five room types if they don't need five room types. But if they tell you we only need one, ask the question twice because one room type might mean that you don't have availability a lot of times. So, but if you give them two room types, there's an opportunity for them to still get a discounted rate, but for you an opportunity to upsell, okay? Um, so that's why one room type, some companies actually say, I only need one, I want the lowest, don't give me anything else. Don't accept that at the beginning, right? Ask again and explain the process. You, everybody does yield management now. Everybody has uh, uh, dynamic pricing. Everybody has um, dynamic demand, when I want to say. So which means sometimes you just can't give that entry room out. So it's for both benefits to have more than one room type selling. Last room availability. Um, well, now last room availability is almost like for global RFPs, not one single one is without last room availability. So um, it's... Uh, sometimes difficult to get around that. But last room availability, please make sure that both parties understand last room availability by room type, okay? Which means, okay, you have to give by that room type the contract rate as long as that room type is still available for bar. But the moment that room type is closed, okay, then uh, you go to the, you can sell bar if this company has not contracted the second room type, right? So that's sometimes misunderstood. Some companies uh, interpreted that as last room availability across the hotel. So as long as you have a room available, even the suite, you should give the contracted rate for the entry category. That's not the case, okay? So just make sure that your sales team and your reservation team, they also understand that. Um, very good. <laughs> And uh, that's for the part of uh, contract negotiation pricing.